Well, hello everyone and welcome to this session at the Prima Donna Festival. And having been to the real in-person Prima Donna last year, I can say this year's online has just been fantastic so far. And I hope you're having a really good weekend. This uh, part of the proceedings, first of all, I want to say this is a very safe space. So uh, we would really like you to respect that, particularly in your commenting later or throughout the session. So my name is Maxime Mawinney, and I'm going to be hosting this session, which is entitled Sweet Sorrow. And if you saw the, uh, the introduction material for it, it's about losing a loved one. Now, we're living in COVID-19, and it's even more devastating at the moment to lose a loved one and also to grieve for them. It's much more difficult, even than in normal times. It's unprecedented, and most of us cannot even imagine what it would be like to have to deal with something like that. We're going to hear some personal aspects of that throughout this session. We want you also to talk about grief as a whole and sorrow as a whole, because when you think about it, it affects all of us in our lifetime, several times in our lifetime, whether it's family members or really close friends. The cultural side of grief as well, how do we deal with it? How do we talk to someone who's grieving, for instance? It's really, really difficult. How do you comfort someone? How do they comfort themselves? What about writing about grief? Is that cathartic? Does it help you as the writer? Does it help the reader? And if so, what does it actually do? And are there things we can do for each other in grief? Now, some of this, of course, will be very bittersweet as well as looking at the aspects dealing with death. And we've got a fantastic panel for you today. Let me just run through them quickly for you. Catherine Mayer. Catherine's husband, Andy Gill from Gaia 4, died on the 1st of February and her stepmother, her stepfather a month earlier. So both Catherine and her mother have been dealing with widowhood. Catherine DePrudo is an integrative psychotherapist specializing in trauma and her father, Tony, died on the 14th of April. She's now campaigning with COVID-19 bereaved families for justice. Huma Qureshi is the author of the forthcoming coming How We Met, a memoir on grief, love, and growing up. That's due out in January 2021. And Heather Rabatz is the solicitor, businesswoman, and broadcaster, and the first black director of the Football Association, as well as being the only female board member. Heather was married to Mike Lee, who died suddenly in 2018. So that's our panel. What I'm going to do is ask each of them to speak for about five minutes, coming from their own perspective on grief. After that, we'll have a conversation between our fantastic guests, and then we will take your questions. Now, as I said, questions on the chat box only, please. We will look for themes throughout them. And if you've got a question for one particular member of our panel, please do ask to that person. Send them to me, but say who you want it to be asked to. I'll keep an eye on it. Right. So let's get started to hear from our guest today. Catherine Mayer, if you would like to start first. Yes, I'm not sure like is the right word. Um, this isn't, this is definitely not the most cheerful of prima donna panels. Um, it today marks exactly uh, six months since Andy died and we're starting this panel at um, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, what that means is that when we finish at four, we're going to come to precisely the anniversary of the moment that um, I agreed with the team at St. Thomas's to remove his life support. Sorry, it's good starting to cry right at the beginning of this, isn't it? Um, and it took him 12 minutes to die. So today at um, 12 minutes past four, think about that. But I would urge you to think about it because we are in this time with these huge excess death tolls. We hear these figures all the time. These figures become unimaginable and dehumanized. We don't think as we should about every individual and that each of those individuals has people um, who are deeply impacted by it. And this is also a time of much wider grief. Maxine mentioned that my stepfather died a month before Andy. Um, my mother at 86 is widowed. We then found ourselves in lockdown and not 
able to do, I guess, some of the things that people would do in the circumstances. Unlike many other people, I had already experienced quite a lot of grief. I've lost a lot of people close to me. So in that sense, I was better prepared than some people might be, though not for lockdown and not for these wider griefs, not just for people lost, but things lost and opportunities lost. Um, the reason I mention the concept of preparedness is I think it's one of the reasons I agreed to do this conversation and why I think it's helpful is you realize as soon as you lose somebody, as soon as you're grieving, how not only um, you are blindsided by certain aspects of it, but how difficult other people find to talk about it. Um, how very ill-prepared we are as a culture uh, to be able to deal with it. And it isn't something you can't... Grief is very strange and motile and shape-shifting, and you can't prepare for everything it's going to do for you. But one of the reasons I not only agreed to this conversation, but I'm now writing a book with my mother about grief, is that it really does help to know certain things and it really does help. Um, I've been lucky enough in spite of lockdown to have wonderful people around me who have been incredibly supportive, but being supportive itself actually requires um, certain levels of understanding. I mean, Maxine used a phrase right at the beginning, asking about whether writing is cathartic. There's an assumption about there being a possibility of catharsis, that, that grief is something that you can get rid of, that crying it out is something useful. It's something I would immediately push back against because for me, what grief is, but also what greeting, gre dealing with grief is, understanding not that you want to get rid of it, but that you want to learn to live with it. So... Just going back to crying again, I've, um, I've never figured out how to place my computer for Zooms very well, but today I have done it with, there's a beautiful mosaic up there of my husband, and I am surrounded, sorry, I'm surrounded by things about him because I have no desire to move on, I want to move forward. So that's what's useful about these conversations. And in spite of the way that I'm crying in having this discussion now, I'd also like you to understand that I am actually doing okay and doing more than okay, that there are ways in which this experience is something that can also be turned to benefit other people. And I think that's really important. Catherine, thank you very much for sharing that with us. It's uh, still very raw, I know, and probably always will be for you. Thank you very much. And please, your tears are most welcome as well. We, we embrace you. Heather, do you want to come in and tell us your perspective? Um, so my husband, Mike, uh, died suddenly. I came home to the house and found that he was dead uh, not quite two years ago. And so much of what Catherine has said uh, sort of resonates with my with myself. I think one of the aspects of grief I've started to understand is that all of those comments that people make, which are well intentioned, of course, which is time will heal, is the great sort of cliche, I suppose, is actually. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't heal. It, it, it is about, uh, you know, learning, learning to live with it and going on that journey um, of both celebration of our life uh, as well as a sense of uh, the loss in tragic circumstances with my husband and therefore a loss of a future life that I still had hoped that we would have together. And so grief is both about the past, the present, and in fact about the future. And isolation 
I suppose as I found um, it's been as it is for all of us uh, a strange a very strange period where I have found that grief has washed back over me because I think about what it would have been like if we had been isolating together he would have hated it absolutely hated it and actually sometimes I feel grateful he's been spared it so he it, it was was not something he would was would have found well we've all found difficult but it, it, it would have been really hard for him but what it has meant is that you're grieving and alone and while and as time goes by you feel more uncomfortable about saying even to friends because they want you to say i'm fine how are you i'm fine and of course i do that a lot with people and actually what i want to say is well i didn't really sleep last night i remembered this moment or this happened and I feel my world has just rocked again and you can't do that. So what starts to happen is you internalize the conversation about grief in your own head, which is exacerbated by isolation because you don't get the usual punctuation moments that we would have had by going out, buying a cup of coffee, meeting a friend for a cup of tea or whatever it might be. And I, I suppose if I have any, insight as I struggle with um, you know my own uh, sense of loss is is actually the more that you can convey to friends that there are days that you just want to say I feel terrible and that they don't feel that somehow they have to cheer you up make you feel better but actually can just absorb and listen and the fact that it's a year or two years or however long your journey is that that is something that becomes part and parcel of your conversation Heather, thank you very much for that i think it's a, a really good phrase you use there about grief being past present and the future and you have to go through well, through it all your life. Um, just as a personal note, I lost my sister five years ago and she didn't tell us she was dying of cancer. So we never got a chance to be with her in the way that we would have wanted it. It was the way she wanted it, which was fine. But I know what you mean about the past, present and future because it's, it's really difficult every day. You know, I think about her every day as well. And, uh, Huma, do you want to... Hi. Yeah, I, I just want to start by saying to Catherine and Catherine and Heather that I'm so deeply sorry for your your losses. Um, I come to this with a different perspective in a way, I guess. Um, I can't imagine what it would be like to lose someone you love to as your partner, your life partner. But I lost my father and, and I lost my father a long time ago as well. So my grief is something that predates uh, lockdown. Um, he died about 15 years ago, I think. Um, I was, I think, about 23 years old. Um, and I say I think because I don't actually remember the dates anymore. And, I, and it's not because I have forgotten it's because that whole period of time for me is just a blur so even if you'd asked me a year after he died when did he die i still couldn't actually tell you because i have to actually work it out on paper um and i think that kind of sums up what that period of, of, of losing my father in in quite um a kind of early stage of neither yet being an adult nor being a child not really knowing where my life was going and then to lose someone who I just assumed and taken for granted would always be there um, unsettled me in ways that I've only just begun to realise um, through the writing of my memoir, How We Met, which started out as a love story really, but then became very apparent that the big bit that I was avoiding writing about was this real life changing moment, which really was before and after and trying to figure out adulthood in the wake of that. Um, 
he died of um he suffered some huge strokes that came out of the blue when I was um, in my early 20s and I was studying abroad in Paris at the time. Um, I came back home and he was ill for a long time. So in a way, we lost him twice, um, but it didn't because he lost his speech. He was locked in and uh, which meant that he couldn't communicate to us and he was half paralyzed. So that was a huge, in some ways, that was the biggest first um, earthquake that hit my family um, but then it didn't it, sometimes people would say well meaningly oh well at least you were prepared but actually I don't think anything prepares you for the moment when they actually just stop and it's over in a split second and that I still very much can't get my head around and and I can't say it's made me particularly stronger because I'm terrified of it I'm terrified that it will happen again and again and again um, in some ways, as I've grown older, I've watched my mother um, be a widow. And that has been heartbreaking because I think as I've got older, I've realized that I don't really know how she's managed to carry on, but she has. And her life is moving in a really positive way um, now she's actually about to sell our family home and downsize and move to London because my siblings and I all live here and she's been really unsentimental about it she's been very pragmatic and practical about it and and that to me you know that kind of drawing a line and, and knowing that her life is continuing but this this chapter a very sad chapter is closed um it just you know I find that I take incredible strength from her in that um, and I think my understanding as I've grown older and growing older is that, like Catherine said at the beginning, it's not something that you just get over, even if it was 15 years ago. I think it's become very simple for me. And that's just that I really miss my dad. And that's what my grief has become. So, Emma, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, and also that time period as well and how it changes but really it doesn't change at all. Uh, Catherine de Prigo. Um, I thought it was going to be okay doing this but I already feel incredibly emotional listening to everybody else's stories. Um, I lost my dad to COVID-19 in April um, and it's, it came as a, a really devastating shock for us. Um, he was only 60 and he didn't have any of the underlying health conditions that were on the, the list of people that, you know, were at risk. Um, we took all the necessary sort of precautions. Um, but it turns out that all the adults in my family were already infected when we went into lockdown. And, you know, 24 hours after the announcement, we all started to go down with symptoms. And um, that's... The rest of us started to get better. My dad didn't make any improvements um, and he was taken into hospital, um, having already suffered from a heart and a bleed on his brain caused by the virus. Um, and he was in hospital for three days alone. We weren't able to visit him. Um, and, you know, we got a call asking if the, the, the life support could be withdrawn. Um, that call happened to come when I just arrived at, at my mum's to drop something off for her um, and we sat outside on two camping chairs waiting for the call to say that he'd gone and when it came we had to stay sitting on two camping chairs three metres apart um, and weren't even able to give each other that you know that really sort of simple but really fundamentally important comfort of just holding one another after receiving that news. Um, I'm a therapist. I um, work with a lot of people who've experienced loss and working through grief. Um, I know all the theory, um, but experiencing it myself has been, you know, very, very different. Um, I agree with a lot of what has already been said about, um, you know, we don't move on when we've lost someone that we love we we find ways to adapt um and integrate that bereavement as part of who we are um you know uh, covid19 or covid19 bereavement is now part of my identity and it always will be um 
it's now part of who I am that that will stay with me forever um and the work that I'm doing now is about how I you know adapt me and my life to to make that fit so that I can move forward and carry it with me in a way that um you know is okay that I can survive um and uh, as you've already mentioned i've become really actively involved in the in the group covid19 um bereaved families for justice and i see um a lot of complexities now around um being bereaved by covid19 as i just said myself about my own experience you know not being able to even hold my mom at that moment and she had to continue self-isolating for another 14 another 11 days after my dad died um and you know as human beings we're born for relationship you know our our, our <laughs> development our um physiology we need to be with others we need human contact for you know a basic survival and um, for people to have been bereaved and, and grieving in isolation is is not natural um we need human contact we need support systems and support networks when we've experienced a, a, an enormous loss um and so we're now dealing with not only a, a, a sort of tsunami of loss that has swept across the country um but a complication in grief um because of the circumstances surrounding people's losses they're not being able to see the person that has died either before they died or after they died um, acceptance is a huge part of the grieving process and if we haven't seen the person that's died how can we possibly start to accept that they've gone um, we have been denied those basic um, rituals of um, you know preparing a body and having a funeral which are all fundamental parts of the grieving process um, so that's something that I'm really really keen now to um, raise awareness of is the need for people to who've been bereaved um, either by COVID or during the lockdown to um, get the right kind of specialist help and support that they need to, to deal with this really complicated um, loss and, and bereavement that people have experienced. Catherine, thank you very much. And very, very moving stories. Uh, but with that theme throughout them of, of coping with the loss. Is the word coping right? I'm not sure it is because Catherine, as you say, Catherine Mayer, you have to live with it. Let's let's pull the discussion between all of us now. Catherine, do you want to start? What did um, you yeah. take from what the others were saying? Yes, there were um, several points I wanted to pick up on. I mean, one of the things that's striking is how much we do all agree and however sort of un unexpected aspects of grief are, the commonalities are also incredible striking which is one of the reasons it is worth listening to other people's mm -hmm. stories because you can't proof yourself against it but you can understand things and Heather was talking about people's urge to to want to see you get better to want to cheer you up I think that's something I'm beginning to experience now at the six month point in the earlier phase, it's the other way around. They sort of want to wring tears out of you and it's incredibly well-meaning. But the thing my mother and I got allergic to was people putting their heads on one side and going, and how are you? And sort of denying you the possibility of any lightness in your life. So um, I can see that there are people who join this Zoom who are actually people who help me a lot with kind of, support practical support things like bringing food around and that kind of thing but also being able still to joke um there's there's somebody on on the zoom i can see called emma who helped me decant andy's ashes uh, i was lucky enough to be able to have a big memorial for him just before lockdown and by the way i mean a whole other part of the story is that he may well have died from covid um so i met Catherine Giprato through the, the COVID bereaved families. Um, I'll go back to that in just a second, but you know, decanting the ashes, we decanted him into a wine flagon because we thought he'd like it. And we actually ended up getting ashes all over the kitchen and it was funny. Um, there, are, there are these moments in grief. Um, Sandy Toxvig, with whom I 
co-founded the Women's Equality Party and also is one of the co-founders of this festival, um, she had this brilliant catchphrase just after Andy died. She'd say something outrageous and then she'd go, too soon, darling. Um, and I, I actually really appreciated the permission to be allowed to laugh as well, to still be myself, because there's an awful lot of external pressure to behave in ways that people expect you to, I think, um, to look, you know, suddenly you're a widow. What does a widow look like? What does a widow do? So Sandy saying to me, you know, you know, you've been this boring heterosexual these years. Now you can start experimenting too soon, darling. Well, I, I actually <laughs> really enjoyed that as a comment. Um, but to the sort of, to the longer term stuff, um, the reason that I also joined the, the COVID Families for Justice is because I actually think that there's a um, coping isn't coping isn't the right word, but finding meaning is is a key thing. It's something um, I don't know if you've ever read um, Joan Didion's Year of Magical Thinking, but she she kind of talks about the loss of meaning. And I think that various forms of activism, like actually through the COVID families trying to get the kind of mental health support that's needed, trying to get uh, an inquiry into this, I think that's really important. Um, I've also done things like, because Andy was a musician, um, I've brought out um, or, or helped worked with the band to bring out um, two EPs that we um, now are releasing together as vinyl and fundraising for St. Thomas's and the NHS. Um, you know, that's obviously more elaborate than some people might do. But the point of it is, is to, you have to, death forces you to reinvent and you're having to figure out who you are now and what meaning you can find. And I think that although you have to look after yourself to a certain extent, the looking outward, the figuring out how you can translate your experience into helping other people who are going to go through or helping other people to avoid what you're going through mm -hmm. is just for me, a really key point, part of it. Catherine, thank you. And I, I want to come back to you a bit later on to talk about the book that you're writing with your mother and, and your shared experiences uh, in widowhood so close together as well. Heather, what resonated with you from what everyone was saying? I think that the, you know, the most powerful points of being that sense of, that, you know, it doesn't, end it doesn't you don't get over it i i think that 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 whole sense of you're allowed to be in quotes in despair for those first uh, six months and i think six months is a definite trigger point where somehow even if it's just from ourselves we think i should now be better i should now be able to be um, out there and uh i can remember somebody saying well do you think you'll have another relationship i thought Oh, that, that, because they could see me performing in a sort of normal way. I was working hard. I was doing my talks on, you know, various different platforms. So they looked at me as if I was all okay. And it was like, I was just bewildered, just bewildered when that was said to me. And I remember reading a book, which was, it was, it's called, um, it's okay not to be okay. And I, I found just the title enormously helpful because somehow I started to think that I was supposed to be okay. So I think letting go of that, I also thought Catherine's point, which is about the sense of the boundaries, that you had this relationship with somebody where the boundaries between the two of you were blurred as you formed this relationship with partnership over so many years. And whilst I know Catherine, and myself have always been two very strong, independent women, as we still are. There was this shared journey of life with this other person who knew 
you in ways that nobody else did who at that two o'clock in the morning when all your fears beset you somehow made you feel all right and i think it's about knowing it's about trying to figure out that there are new boundaries to self going forward that there isn't this person who you have that connection to uh, and i think that's what i'm trying to sort of explore i suppose in these in these days i also uh, relate very much to the point about being active uh i've always been i suppose a workaholic um work definitely became my shield it was like a way i could be engage in the world on my terms without always having to explain what had happened uh and i think it's about you know those awful words balance but i i am conscious that i can bury myself in work because i'm trying to avoid ongoing pain uh and somehow you have to you do have to keep stepping back into that pain uh, um it doesn't lay low um and i'm still struggling with that calibration that navigation between living my own life but also trying to hold on to this sense of myself with my, the person who I deeply loved. Emma, what was it like writing your book and writing about that journey in love and grief? Um, well, I'd written about my father's illness before a long time ago. I, I suppose I wrote about it maybe a two or so years ago, years after he died, um, when I was a journalist at The Guardian, I, I wrote a big piece about um, his being, his, his act of being locked in and locked in syndrome. And, but I never talked about his death in that article. I kept that very much for me. Um, I didn't really understand how I felt in a way, which might sound really silly and it's not because I was young I think it's just that I was lost for words for a very long time about it um and when I wrote the first draft of how we met um which like, like I'd said was it, it was originally intended to be this lovely love story of how I met my husband and um although it's slightly deeper than that but um there was an obvious there was an obvious gap which I hadn't probed and it came out in draft after draft that I need to face this big chapter of my life because it explains so much that had come afterwards that I don't think and again this might sound really silly that I hadn't put two and two together that certain decisions that I'd made or certain behavior or actions or attempts to try and do things my way and um, all, all these little things all linked back to this sense of sudden loss at a time in my life where I just took it for granted that I'd always have a father to you know open my savings account and look after me and do all the things that dads did when you're you just graduated from university um, and I think it just I think I could have only written that for me. I could have only written that now because I've, you know, I've grown in that time. I've, I've, you know, got three children of my own now. And in that role of being a parent, I am able to acknowledge so much more what it, what his role as a parent was. And I, I distinctly remember that when we first knew that it was, there was no way out of this stroke. Um, that we were not going to hear him even talk again and so on. Um, I remember my first thought was, I'm not, I'm not ready for that, let alone him being ready for that. It was a very selfish sort of, uh, but I'm not done yet. Um, I'm also the youngest in my family and I had this really distinct feeling that he'd seen them become something. And he literally died on my very first day at work at The Observer and I had to go into the editor's office in the morning to explain that my father was about to die um and I just I was like he hasn't seen me become anything or anyone yet and I felt very much um 
like I've only just, I think, come to terms with how that feeling really shaped me for such a long time, this sort of feeling that I didn't know what I could do or um, hadn't yet found who I was, wanted to be because I sort of always thought I'd have some guidance along the way. And that became apparent in the act of writing. Um, and it was the section that I sort of writing about grief um, became such an apparent theme of the book, but also a theme of my life that I hadn't stopped to think about in the last 15 years. And that way that writing about your own life very much forces you to look at yourself in ways that you wouldn't normally. So I think in the aftermath of my father's death, I'd just started this job. I'd just moved to London. I just, you know, everything was just beginning. So I had all these other focuses that were trying very hard to get me to move on, um, pulling me in these other directions. But I don't think I had the luxury really I call it a luxury, but you know, it, you don't often sit there with your grief for that long and put it into words that may mean something to you, but also mean something to someone else. And um, it was, it felt, I don't know, I mean, I, I look back at the, those moments that I'd written um, and I look back and I think um, when I read that now, I feel a sadness, but I also feel a lightness. Um, like I, I feel like I have gone past remembering him as only being very, very sick. And I can kind of see that journey as to what I've taken from him. Um, and I think that's what came together for me in the writing of the book. Um, but while I'm, while I've got the, the mic for a bit, I just wanted to say that I really resonated with what Catherine with a C said about, um, the kind of cultural way that people back off or don't don't give enough um and i don't mean that in a way that is judgmental of other people i think it's they they don't especially when i was when it happened to me i had no friends who'd lost a father and i still there's no one in my age group that's lost a parent so it's just become a fact of life for me now but i remember back then being a very stark difference between the way my um, family who was of Pakistani background and our family friends were all around us instantly and they 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 there is no stiff upper lip and there is no politeness and they they're around you and they will grab you in their arms and they will feed you and they will be in the house with you constantly and I remember feeling a great deal of comfort from that even though that was something as a teenager I really kind of uh, shied away from but it was such a stark difference from my even my best friends who were not of that background but who are of the same age who just wrote letters and they were very much of the when you're ready to talk about it we'll talk about it and I found that so distinctly different and I kind of wanted to say but but I don't I'm not going to just be ready to talk about it. I just need you guys to be here. And I, and again, I don't know if some of that was something to do with being in your early 20s and you kind of feel like your university friends, your friends forever and, and all of that. But the difference between that those worlds, it became very apparent to me which what I valued in the culture that I've been brought up with. And I, I recognize that now, um, that now I don't, I don't, I don't maintain any boundaries in that sense that if someone has lost someone, I, I will just, I'll be there for them. I will cook for them. I will do what they, I, I will talk about it. I won't just pretend like it didn't happen. And I think that's because I kind of had that experience and, and you realize that. So. And it's really interesting, Huma, that you say that because I'm from Ireland and we approach death in a very similar matter, manner. Um, there's the funeral, but immediately everyone is there. They're holding you. Um, they're just pulling you close. Um, there's the celebration of life as well, I suppose, yeah. during the wake, which is really important. And Catherine, the Prudhoe, that's something that you were you didn't get. No. COVID. No, and that 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 was really sort of um, really hit home for me when you you talked about that then, Hummer. That you know those social norms that you know when someone dies people flock to to take care of you and and do those things and no we didn't have any of that and we still haven't had it um you know the only people that could do anything were people who lived immediately close by who you know dropped meals on the doorstep 
um, or a card through the letterbox and everything else was at a distance. Um, and even now, you know, um, three months on, we still haven't met with any family. Um, you know, my mum and I, you know, we're fortunate enough that we've been able to be in a bubble and she can be with us. Um, but we haven't met with a single member of our family um, since my dad died. And it, it's those, those really basic I said who human connections that, that we need in those moments that sustain us that we, we just haven't been able to have and Catherine um, sorry if I could just come in there as a yeah. counselor yourself someone who helps people yes how damaging do you think what is happening with COVID and the fact that you, you suffered your loss during COVID Catherine suffered hers and COVID, you know, we've been in lockdown since how damaging has that been to the healing process um, I can only go on, you know, what I already know and a little bit of research that I've read so far. But I do think that there's going to be some very long, drawn out, very complex grief going on um, because we need those things. We need human connection. And if I talk a tiny little bit about, you know, what a shock and loss and trauma does to us, you know, our physiology and our brains, that we go into, you know, fight flight response, our, our um, you know, our, our um, nervous system is, is triggered into you know really high alert and you know one of the things that therapy does for someone who's in that state is to be with another person who is calm and grounded that it helps really bring that fight flight response down it helps you to you know regulate your your you know your your stress response um, and the fact that there are going to be so many people who've been grieving alone or with others who are grieving um, and they haven't been able to reach out for that kind of human contact that could help them regulate. Uh, we potentially got thousands and thousands of people who are in this really triggered state with, with no mechanism to try and bring it down. Um, and then you, you know, start to think about the, the implications of that kind of thing, um, it, you know, on health, physical health, mental health, and who are in a long-term trauma state, you know, sometimes turn to addictions or anxiety disorders come from it. There's a there's a huge issue here that you know potentially is going to come out of, of the, the you know being bereaved in lockdown situation. Okay, thank you very much. I know everyone can see the comments on the side on the chat box if you've got your chat box up. Uh, comfort in reading memoirs of grief. Um, the, 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 no guidance. I, uh, Laura, you've, you've sent one saying one of the things I initially find really difficult when my ex-husband died, there's no guidance or predefined way about what you should feel or act because you were the ex-wife. And I think that's the thing. There's a bit of a not sure what to do. Um, Audrey saying other people's performative grief was very intrusive. Well, yeah, you can see that quite a lot of the time as well. And some of you have mentioned that type of thing as well. If you've got any questions for the speakers, do put them up now. Um, Catherine, Mayor, I want to come back to you because one of the striking things um, I felt after Andy died, you, you did your blog, but you also started posting la pictures of landscapes with, with Andy and without Andy. And I thought that was just the most amazing and poignant thing because, you know, it, he was gone in those landscapes without him. And it, it was, for me, it, I really felt your loss through those, but I also thought it was a very interesting thing for a very creative person to do. Why did you do that? It started because of lockdown, um, because of those walks. Uh, you were allowed one moment of exercise every day. And exercise was incredibly important to me. Going on walks was incredibly important to me. But because it was limited and because travel was limited, it meant that I in inevitably was retracing the routes that he and I had most often taken from our flat. Um, and so every vista, what every vista, his absence was so visible because it was our sat we we used to walk together every weekend and so it was our weekend walks and so um i would come around a corner and think oh this is where we did this and then i would think actually i've got a picture of that so i just started taking exactly framing the same picture um but pairing them up with ones that he was in and then ones that 
he was not in. And um, it's interesting because, you know, part of the, the, I guess, the slight madness of grief is that I then started walking further and further to try and get to, once I got to the ones that were in reasonable distance, I started kind of thinking, well, I can just walk that bit further and get there. So um, I ended up um, at one point walking about 20 kilometers a day uh, doing this and lost all of my toenails. Um, but um, it did express something that I wanted to express. I called it landscapes with and without Andy, but actually they're all with him. I can't I be... Sorry, I just wanted to... Oh, do come in, yeah, go on. Yeah, I just wanted to say, and Catherine's point, I, I found that I was, Mike took endless pictures and, um, you know, fat, thousands with crazy number of pictures. And I realized I was ordering pictures and setting them out to try and chart a life. And exactly as you've just said, we used to do these walks and I felt really aware as I was doing the walks that, that Mike was absent and yet not. And, uh, I suppose that's yeah. Uh, I yeah. But how, how, how important are photographs to memory was it in grief? Because I know when we were suffering grief in our family, I found them really difficult to look at for quite a long time. Um, Catherine, you're 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 very recent. Are, are you able to look at photographs? I not? have. I, I've looked at lots. Um, I had a, a an art, a, you know, a hard, an external hard drive that. They were, lots of mine were archived on and I got those out a couple of weeks ago and started to look through them and um, it was it was very hard you know there's a lot of sadness but what it has done is helped me to start remembering um, and you know bringing back into I guess into my sort of conscious awareness memories of really really wonderful times that I had with my dad that I hadn't thought about for a long time um, maybe because I didn't need to um, but it yes it, and it's something that we do use in therapy too you know to ask people to bring photographs they can be so much meaning in a photograph or a captured moment um, and it's certainly something that I'm finding really helpful yeah. Uh, it's very powerful to share a photograph with somebody too you tell them your story in words and you're relying on their imagination um but if you can share a photograph especially one that you feel really captures the person that you've lost um it, it can it, it tells so, so much more than the words it can convey a lot a lot <laughs> about what you've lost as well um i have a photograph Actually, I'm just I'm I'm just going to share it on the screen for a moment. Um, it's it's this, and that was the last time that we saw my dad um, just before lockdown. Um, that's my son that he's playing with, and I've shared that far and wide because it's a moment that's now captured forever as the last time we spent together as a family. And so many people have said to me about how what a powerful photograph it is. It really captures, you know, it captures my dad. It captures the bond between my dad and my son. Um, it, and, you know, there's so much love in that photograph. It's so symbolic as of, of us as a family and that last time that we shared together. And Toma, for you, those photographs, the archive photographs now of your father, especially precious when you look back they are actually i mean it's it's funny the timing of this because yesterday was was eid and i visited my mum but partly one of the main reasons for that was because she wanted me to empty out my bedroom because she's downsizing and um she'd set aside all these photo albums for me she's sort of taken what what she'd wanted and Interestingly, the photos that I'm more drawn to of my dad are from the time before I was born, actually, or when I was very, very little, like, say, when I was the age of my children now, who are all under six. There's something about looking back, and, and I, I don't necessarily, I don't remember those child, pre early, early childhood years, but there's something that moves me deeply about seeing the sort of father he was with me, which is just as I imagined he would have been um, in these very, very old photos. So, you know, I, I don't 
remember any of them. These are like photos with me of me as a toddler with my dad or my dad and my mum. In fact, I, I, I really like photos of my parents from their that sort of like late seventies when they were newlyweds because there's something about the idea that they had this life before us and I just find that really beautiful and I wish I'd known more about it. Um, and yeah, so I find myself really drawn to these images of him when he was younger. Um, and he's this very much the, the man that I have in my head. Um, and, I, and I, yeah, I like that. I, it's sort of really strange as well in a way because I don't have memories of that, but seeing them, it just shows a different side to, so there's like a piece of the story that I don't know and I'm quite happy to not have it all explained but just to have these these images of his youth. One, one of the... Oh sorry, go ahead. Please. Sorry, I was just going to say one of the things that's interesting, so because I'm with my mother mm. a lot talking about our overlapping experiences but also how it diverges she's 86 she's living on her own for the first time and she's having to get to grips with the digital world really for the first time she hadn't been on social media she had hadn't had a smartphone she absolutely bloody hates the smartphone that we've got her but it meant that in terms of photos you know, we're so used to having this huge universe of photos that we've documented everything. She really doesn't have that many and they therefore sort of attain more significance. When we were trying to put together um, things around my stepfather John's death, you know, trying to find the good photos, the photos that weren't faded, the photos where they were both looking at the camera, it's actually very hard. Um, and it made me think a lot about the ways in which um, in this particular crisis as well, the deaths of older people have tended to be discounted as if they mattered less. And I think there was something there relating to the smaller digital footprint that in some way we've now become so, so kind of focused on that online world that it actually had a difference and made a difference. But it was also interesting to me, I mean, another thing she and I discussed, and it relates to photos as well, is when you love somebody and you've lost them, you want to hold on to your version of them. And other people start telling you theirs and they start trying to kind of enforce a, a other ideas. And it's all very well meant. You know, there's this lovely thing of comparing memories. But there's also a thing where you really want to hold on to the to the essence of that person and the essence of your love for them. And so that's again where these really personal things matter a huge amount. Catherine, I was going to come to you and ask you to, we've got a few minutes left to finish off actually by talking about the book that you're writing with your mother. And I, I know some of this is slightly humorous as well, such as the sadmin instead of the admin. And I know that's been particularly frustrating for you. Uh, in a couple of minutes, just give us a flavor of that before we have to finish. Sure. Well, um, we're writing a book together. It actually consists of, it, it started because my, I started blogging about Andy's death and I did that weirdly as a way to be private because, because he was a public figure. I had a lot of people asking me questions all the time and I had a lot of people asking me questions about me and how I was feeling and I thought somehow if I blogged it I could control it and just give people here go away and read this. But then also I discovered that he may have died from COVID and that that would have extraordinary public health implications for the response on COVID. So then I started blogging about that and so um, my publisher asked me if I would do a book and I said I don't feel ready to do a book but my mother is writing these amazing letters because she had sat down um, 90 days or so after my stepfather died and written the first of a series of letters to him about how she felt and what had happened in the world since he died. So she actually ended up charting, she didn't mean to, but she charted the pandemic and she charted all of these wider issues as well as how she was feeling. And they're really beautiful letters, they're very direct. 
And so I showed them to the publisher and the publisher said, well, actually, I think it would be wonderful if you wrote something together. And I kind of persuaded myself that that was something I could do. And yes, we're, I mean, one of the things we wrestle with on a weekly basis is because I, I have been sort of her designated carer under the terms of who could go inside under lockdown. So very carefully distanced and whatever, but I've been cleaning and cooking and doing all sorts of practical stuff. But we've also been try- wrestling with um, sadmin, which is terrible at the best of times. Um, the, the bureaucracy of death is appalling. Um, but in under the pandemic, things have uh, got so much worse. You know, you have these things of ringing, ringing institutions' bereavement lines and discovering the bereavement lines are closed because of COVID. And, you know, there's a, a three-hour wait to get through to anything. As I mentioned, it's six months since Andy died. I, I still don't actually have access to his bank accounts um, I'm still wrestling to get things transferred into my name, etc. So we are going to have in the book, some of our experience was, well, we're not doing it like a kind of handbook or anything, but we just want people to understand what, what this is like. Because again, there are certain ways in which you can prepare yourself. And there's a strange kind of way in which that, horrendous bureaucracy deprives you of the chance to grieve in the way that you want to it's it's a contaminant it's it's you shouldn't be you shouldn't be sitting there as somebody who is you love has just died worrying about you know whether the electricity is going to be cut off Mm -hmm. but that's of course what's what happens so often and and so yeah i mean that's just a part of the book we're telling we're telling our stories Catherine, thank you very much indeed. So we're coming to the end of our session. You probably all have been able to read uh, some of the comments and and not necessarily questions, but things that have helped people on the side. And even after, you know, 26 years, Nicola Jennings saying, I find the photographs of my mum very comforting, but can't read the letters. Um, It's it's really hard. I'm just going to pull a few phrases from what we've heard today about grief. It's the past, the present, it's the future. You're constantly trying to find meaning. People hugging you, as Huma said, but in that way where it's them coming together and hugging you, not as Catherine was saying, how are you doing? The sad men. And Catherine DePrudo trying to deal with all of this during COVID, a COVID death and all the related fallout from that. I just want to say uh, thank you to our speakers today. You've been so kind to open your emotions to us and bring that side of things and maybe hopefully make us all think a little bit more. Catherine Mayer, just before we finish, we're all embracing you in a big hug and me especially in the next hour. Have strength. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of Prima Donna. It's such a unique festival and it's fantastic women and some men as well. Thank you very much indeed.